Hello and welcome. Here we are in lecture 21. So today we'll be uh, concluding our, you know, final set of three lectures where we are talking about fertile. So we'll of course be covering what that, what that is, but uh, I think you've already kind of have some hints about what this involves, right? And this is of course uh, within the, the tool flow, right? That fertile is this layer in between chisel and Verilog. And so we'll see kind of two things, right? That not only one, does make it easier for them to make and develop the tool flow that we use, but actually what we're going to cover today is actually if we're an advanced user, going in here can let us do really, really cool things. And although Fertile is just one uh, IR, I hope to convince you by the end of this lecture that the future of hardware design actually involves people uh, really playing with the hardware IR. So if you don't know what an IR is, no worries. We're going to cover all of that today. So, uh, of course, I'm going to motivate this talk about Fertile and give some examples. We actually run some tiny code snippets involving it, and then we'll really kind of get to the point of what this is all about. Okay, so first let's go ahead and load in the uh, notebooks. Great. Um, okay, so, uh, you know, let's kind of remind ourselves we're doing all quarter, we've been making hardware generous, right? We're using Chisel, and you know, we've all gotten pretty good at them. You know, you're doing your projects right now, you're doing some really neat stuff, you know, you're using programming in Scala to design hardware. In particular, you're instantiating, you know, chisel components, right? We discussed it. Really making hardware is simply a matter of instantiating blocks and connecting blocks. That's really all, all, all we're doing, right? And the Scala is kind of this nice way we can really kind of get this various elegance or flexibility to how we choose to connect those components and how we instantiate them, right? And kind of take a step back of what we're doing, what hardware generators do is they're actually allowing us to automate the process of making hardware, right? So uh, you know, in language like Verilog, to kind of, you know, state everything line by line and every exact component, there's not really much um, intelligence there, right? It's just a single design instance, right? With a generator, of course, we now can automate creating different instances, right? And that's the whole point. And so, um, as you learn writing these generators, is that, you know, when you're writing a generator, you kind of need to imagine all possible scenarios where the output generator might be used. And then, you know, for those scenarios and you have parameters so the user can request those, uh, you know, particular outputs and then you need to make the generator actually do those, right? And um, depending on how you're doing things, you found that, you know, making these generators takes a certain amount of uh, cleverness sometimes, right? You know, how to, you know, actually implement something to be generalized, right? It's easy to say, oh, it's the parameter you can turn this knob, but actually thinking about how do I need to change the wiring internally, how do I need to stanchion things internally, that can be tricky sometimes, right? And, um, and so the kind of way you solve some of these problems are very much implementation specific, right? For a certain generator. And then you may find that uh, you solve these problems just in the generator in a common case, right? But then, you know, on a certain project, you need to optimize the hard design in a certain way. And so you kind of put certain optimizations in the generator. We got to kind of both make the technology of optimizations in the generator, as well as, you know, handling the generality of the generator. Um, so sometimes eventually it starts getting hard, right? Uh, so let's kind of talk about what happens, right? Um, so imagine, you know, you had this issue where you had a generator, it was great. You actually push it through your physical design tool flow and you find out, oh my gosh, you know, uh, this component is not meeting our PPA goals. We need to go ahead and optimize it, right? We've actually measured it. We know we're not there. We need to change it in order to reach our PPA goals, right? Uh, you know, power performance scenario. And so, okay, well, you need to optimize it, right? And if you're going to optimize it, uh, you could optimize the variable that came out of Chisel, but that's that's a lot of work, right? You don't really get any much automation there because you have to kind of keep re-optimizing that. That's not very good. So no, you want to optimize the Chisel, you want to optimize the generator. Um, like I said, if you do this for one generator or one technology library, yeah, you, you could do this, right? But let's say you've already gone through that process, right? And now you're doing another generator, which has the exact same uh, you know, need for optimization and Oh man, wouldn't it be great if I could somehow reuse that code rather than like copying and pasting the code from optimization into my other generator? How can I do that, right? And so if you try to solve this, we talked before in this class, what wouldn't you try, right? You might try something like, hey, you know what? If I do some clever Scala, maybe I can, you know, use generic types or inheritance and make some sort of code that like, you know, in a common case generically performs optimization and include that code in these different generators, right? Uh, and then everyone that wants to use this optimization needs to, you know, modify their code to be compatible with it, but they could, you know, instantiate the optimization, right? Um, and so in some cases, this might be possible, right? Uh, what would this involve? This would involve 
uh, you know, trying to figure out kind of a common pattern for optimization you want to do for hack, so maybe some like pipelining, like we covered in our lecture previously. Okay, if you want to do some kind of pipelines, uh, you need to kind of figure out like reasonably flexible abstraction that kind of supports everyone, and then try to do it, right? And you're going to see pretty quickly in a hurry that it's really hard to kind of, for many optimizations, to kind of capture a common pattern. It's just not too general, right? So you only have some amount of specificity so you have a chance of implementing it. But if it's too specific, it's not very reusable, right? So you kind of have this challenge that, you know, imagine someone's, you know, uh, generator, right? It's basically arbitrary Scala. We say it's chisel, but that's, it's Scala calling chisel commands, right? And so it's really hard to make someone to kind of uh, interface with that, right? Because so, the reason why this interface is just too broad, right? You're just trying to say, I have this, you know, chisel generator, and I want to compatible with chisel gen all chisel generators. That, that seems really hard, right? Uh, because, you know, it's, it could be undefined arbitrary scholar, right? How can you make this mesh up well? It's, it's, it's not going to mesh up well, right? And so the, there is an answer, right? And of course, the, the, um, the intuition is, you know what? Actually, rather than trying to apply this optimization uh, when you're generating the hardware, what if instead we generate the hardware and then optimize it? Right, and at first it may seem like, wait a second, why why should we generate hardware that we don't necessarily think is optimal or optimize at the beginning? And the answer is by optimizing it after it's already instantiated, we now have a more common interface. Rather than having you know arbitrary chisel Scala generators, we're not talking about something that comes in the format of a hardware design, right? In particular, you know, instantiated hardware. And so, for some optimizations, it's actually much easier to think of it in those terms, right? To think of it as hey, uh, you know, you want information, you want to go in your design and you see this kind of property, you want to place it with some other property. Well, I could go in with a tool and go and do that, right? And uh, it'd be much easier. It's almost kind of like you're building your own custom CAD tool, right? You know, the CAD tools do some optimizations currently, but they don't do other optimizations. With this process, you know, modifying the hardware design, you're kind of almost like making your own uh, tool, right? And what's cool about this is by putting in the tools rather than the generator, it can now be easily used on other designs, right? And those other designs don't even have to even come from generators. They could be static, you know, single instance designs, right? The point is that when you can when able to move something from, you know, your code into the tools themselves, it now becomes way more usable by a lot more people in a lot more contexts, right? Um, and so what's interesting is now we're kind of, you know, getting this world where rather than being just, you know, I write a design and then pass up the tools and tools will also work, it's now I write this generator which has some of automation and smarts, right? And now we're also talking about perhaps writing code that actually works downstream into tools, kind of acting like tools, kind of adding additional smarts. So kind of this, you know, old school world of just, you know, design goes in, hardware comes out. Now we're kind of, you know, making it a little bit of a longer interface, having the ability to kind of go farther in a tool flow, but we can do some really cool stuff this way. Um, so I've kind of motivated this as an optimization, right? But there's plenty of times where it's not an optimization. It's actually something you want to do design to make it manufacturable, testable, whatever. For example, I think previously we were talking about, you know, designing uh, for test and, you know, one thing you might want to do is have the ability to, when the chip actually exists, to kind of set certain values and certain registers to kind of check certain things. Uh, so sometimes that's one way of doing this, we call a scan chain, where it's actually like a other set of circuitry that allows you to arbitrarily set the value of a given registry from the outside, which is a pretty cool piece of technology. Uh, and so you can imagine if you write the generator to kind of, every time you have a register to put in all stuff for a scan chain, that's a pain in the butt, right? You wouldn't want to do that. But if you made an optimization later on that could go in or a path later on that goes in and takes your hard design, finds every register in your design, it crawls around design, looks for registers. If a register, it attaches to the scan chain, instantiates the scan chain and gives the interface for it. Wow, that'd be cool. And if someone did that once and made this as part of like a tool flow, every other design can use this without them actually worry about scan chains, right? So this would be really cool to kind of get stuff into the tools, right? So all core we're talking about putting things into tools in the front. Now we're talking about actually putting things in the tools in the middle, right? And so perhaps one way to think of this is uh, this curve here. So this is a curve you may have seen. It's an implementation uh, complexity curve. I don't know if you've seen this in other courses. But the idea is we're talking about how hard the things we're trying to do, how complex it is, versus how hard is it actually to do in practice, right? So if you're writing a single design instance, could be some language like Verilog or even Chisel to find any flexibility, if it's a really simple design, you don't worry about any kind of parameterization or generation, it's really easy to do, right? Um, and then as you start doing a more complicated, more sophisticated, more arbitrary uh, design, eventually it gets complicated in a hurry, right? Um, and at some point, you're doing basically everything manually, it's really hard, 
and oof, you know it's, it's it's hard right and there's no reuse right you just it's a lot of work and so in this course we've been pitching generators which compared to a single instance yeah for a releasable case it's a little bit more work but pretty quickly you're gonna be happy you did this because it's going to be able to handle more types of flexibility and parameterization much more easily than a single static design however at some point you're gonna kind of run to this wall where it's gonna kind of be like oh wait you know, I've, you know, I'm using only functional programming, inheritance, et cetera, object oriented. But man, this took optimization I want to do. It's hard to reuse. It's hard to kind of do just the way I want to do it. Um, and so to kind of flatten out this having a much more graceful, gradual uh, path and difficulty, we're going to add a custom transformation. So transformation is the thing I kind of been building up to this idea of having something in the tool flow that does something we specified that kind of the accomplishes whatever goal, whether it be an optimization or um, something similar, right? You know, or you want to add a scan chain or add a built-in self-test or whatever, right? Uh, handles reset in a certain special way. Um, so yeah, so these kinds of things. As you can see, this kind of really comes into play. We start trying to do more ambitious generators. For simple generators, what we've covered really kind of covers it. It's more we're really trying to go get advanced. This is where it kind of comes in. Okay, and so uh, how would one go about building uh, an entire CAD to us? Seems like a really daunting task, right? Uh, it can be, uh, but fortunately we can learn a lot from what's already well appreciated in the program language community, and compilers community, right? And so one of the key innovations that communities developed decades ago is something called an intermediate representation or an IR, right? And so an IR is, it's a way of, you know, having a well-specified, well-defined syntax for what you're dealing with, right? Because you can imagine um, if you don't have this, you end up with a lot of different, uh, you know, ways of describing hardware or, or software and the code gets really complicated really fast. So with an IR, you say, no, 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 no. This is the grammar. These are the things, you know, this is how everything works. This is exact. And so you don't have to worry about handling these cases. And if you handle all of those cases, you've handled everything, right? Because everything has to kind of conform to this, right? And so when IR is, you know, something that sits between uh, the middle of a tool, right? So the front of the tool is called a front end that takes in the language you're reading, whether it could be C or C++ plus for software or in case of hardware, maybe something like Chisel. That's the front end. That produces the intermediate representation or IR. And then in the middle of the tool, all the optimizations and transformations are done by at the IR level. And then at the end, the IR is turned to the target, right? Where, you know, the typical software compiler, you know, you have your IR and it gets mapped to assembly instructions in the target ISA. Uh, or in the case of hardware, you're gonna map it to some piece of hardware or, or another language, right? In our case, we're mapping it to Verilog, right? And so what's cool with an IR is, if you have a tool flow that exists, it uses an IR, people can come in and only change parts of the tool as long as they can kind of speak and interact with this IR, right? So for example, uh, if you want a new optimization, well, you just need to manipulate the IR in the middle of the tool flow, right? You don't need to worry about parsing chisel, you don't need to worry about writing Verilog, you just need to worry about understanding the IR and how I can read it and modify it, right? And then boom, if you can do that, you can make your own optimization. Or you know what? What if you decide, I don't like Chisel. I'm in my own language, right? Okay, cool. You actually don't need to make everything. You just need to make something that produces the IR and you can reuse the rest of this tool flow, right? So you seem to make a front end that supports that new language. Or let's say, you know what? You decide that the tools, hardware, hardware tools you're trying to talk to don't speak Verilog, speak VHDL. Okay. So now you need a new backend. So now you need to make some in-maps from the IR to VHDL. You don't need to go to an entire giant leap from Chisel to VHDL, right? Just from that IR to VHDL. Um, so this is kind of a well-known uh, best practice. And uh, a lot of hardware tools, CAD tools, had an IR internally. But the key thing that didn't happen until recently was these IRs were kind of private and proprietary, right? Uh, they were not specified, right? And so the reason why this is done is, you know, if they it allows them to kind of change it from version to version however they want, and a lot of things kind of happen. But it turns out you get a wonderful benefit if you actually take your IR and you spec uh, specify it and, you know, publicize it, right, and kind of make it exposed, right? Because now all of a sudden people can make their own code that kind of works with it. And so this is kind of, you know, the adoption of, you know, uh, sorry, I should say the widespread use of, you know, hardware IR is kind of, you know, in conjunction with the recent surge in, you know, open source hardware design tools, right? And the reason why is, you know, it's helping both sides, right? The IR makes it easier to make design and implement these tools. 
but it also makes it easier for people to reuse code, right? And so the IR is really kind of making these open source tools uh, really valuable and really a lot better, right? And so kind of the key difference is previously tools may have had an IR, but in the last, you know, 10 years, these IRs have become specified and adopted by multiple tools, and that's becoming kind of like a real standard in a way. Um, so one of those IRs is Fertile, which is a... Go ahead. Yeah. Great question. So I'm going to repeat this for the recording. So the question was, oh yeah, in software, when you have an IR, uh, the student explained a certain trait that you know a lot of software IRs have. Are there common in hardware IRs? Definitely, right? Um, there's some subtle nuances between different hardware IRs, but you know, you can kind of imagine, you know, eventually you're going to have to have things like, you know, logic gates, registers, they kind of are still expressing the same things. It's just the, the, the nuances, right? You know, does your IR let you uh, have combinational loops. Some do, some don't. Does your IR let you have uh, asynchronous uh, reset? Does your IR let you instantiate modules or have, you know, the semi templated or is it always concrete, right? And so, yeah, there's a variety of different things, but uh, you look across hardware IRs, there's definitely kind of a common thing. I don't think the hardware community is quite as um, formalized as the compiler community to say, you know, you must have these traits or you're not, a, you know, a reasonable IR. I don't think they're quite that level of solidity yet, but we're getting there, right? Um, good question. Um, yeah, so let's talk about the one IR in particular. So the one uh, the namesake for this lecture is uh, Fertile. Uh, and this is the IR for Chisel, right? And um, what's interesting is actually it wasn't, you know, part of the first version of Chisel. So we've been using you know, Chisel 3.5 this quarter. So naturally you're wondering, oh, what, what, what about Chisel 1 and Chisel 2, right? So uh, I was, you know, around for a number of those, right? So uh, Chisel 1, um, it's really just kind of a proof of concept, right? And then Chisel 2 actually had some, some meat to it. Uh, actually, chips were made using Chisel 2. And uh, Chisel 2 was this big, scary, monolithic code base, right? Where there was kind of an IR, but it wasn't very formalized or rigid. And so every time you wanted to do a certain optimization or transformation, you really had to understand not just the hardware, but also the Chisel code, right? The, sorry, Chisel internals code, right? And so... This is a real problem, right? Because um, it was really hard to work with. The buried entry for any new developers kind of joining this project was astronomical. They really had to understand a lot. Um, it had some bugs, we never quite trusted it. Uh, it had issues, right? And so, you know, clearly there was the need for rewrites. So when they made Chisel 3, it also coincided with the creation of, you know, uh, Fertile, this Chisel IR. And oh my gosh, was it a nine day difference. So even though, you know, on day one, it wasn't of course bug free, but, uh, the number of bugs was still low and they're able to kind of trace them down, check, check them down real fast. And in the years since, you know, the robustness has really, really, really improved. And it's not clear, it's, sorry, it's pretty clear that if we had not done this change from Chisel to, you know, using Fertile internally, uh, even the same developer effort, we'd have a much less robust tool today, right? And so what they do, well, they took this giant monolithic code base and kind of use this nano pass or mini pass approach. Or basically what it means is you always have your design in the IR, in this case, Fertile, and you just make small changes to it at a time, right? So, oh, I want to do this particular optimization. Okay, I'm only going to do this specific optimization under specific circumstances. So I'm going to do what's called a pass. I'm going to take the IR in, make the small changes, and spit another copy's IR out, right? And so by doing many, many of these passes, you know, in the case of the actual run, you may actually do like 60 or 70 of these by the time it goes front to end. Um, each pass does a little bit. It's a very specific thing. It's well specified. You can easily kind of test it with things that look kind of like unit tests. Uh, you know, someday you might be able to formally verify these passes. Um, it's a way to kind of get correct and develop, right? Uh, and so this has been really cool and it's really helped a lot. So that's why when people are developing, you know, Chisel nowadays, the Chisel front ends, you know, comparatively kind of thin. And a lot of what we think of Chisel as doing is actually being done as fertile passes inside the fertile. And so you may have heard this word fertile quite a few times. Maybe it's worth me kind of clarifying that you're not, you're not alone. There's some ambiguity because fertile kind of refers to multiple things, right? Number one. It's this IR, right? So it's, it's a specified format, right? And, you know, certain node types, we'll cover some of those node types in a minute, uh, and that kind of stuff, right? And then there is an instance of Fertile, like, you know, your particular design at the Fertile level, 
if you've you know, gone digging around in some of your directories for this course, you may have seen .fir. So that's that IR, you know, serialized to a file. Sometimes speaking casually, we'll say, oh yeah, you know, your design in Fertile, right? Oh yeah, you take the Fertile in, right? We're kind of referring to a particular design instance. And then um, there's also a code base that, you know, works on Fertile, which is the Fertile library, which is also called Fertile. So that's why I keep hearing these different names over and over again. It's both a library, an instance of code, as well as a format, right? That's kind of why it's three things, right? So the library works on a format and it takes in, uh, you know, instances of it, right? But Fortunately, I think by context, you often kind of figure out which ones we're referring to. Um, as suggested by Chow, I'll kind of verbalize this. There is a really great workshop called WOSET, or I'm trying to remember the acronym. I believe it's the Workshop for Open Source uh, ECAD Tools. Uh, and so this is, you know, usually associated with the ICCAD conference. Uh, and so, yeah, so if you go digging around, uh, you can find this conference involved multiple times. It's kind of like a wonderful place to learn about open source CAD tools. Um, and yeah, so things like Chisel and Fertile have been introduced there. A lot of other IRs and other tools have also been introduced there, right? And yeah, there definitely were multiple talks about hardware IRs because that's a really interesting, important thing these days. Um, cool. Okay, so to kind of be concrete about what we're talking about, right? You have the, uh, your Chisel design goes in, you know, it's not shown, of course, is you know, you, it's compiled by Chisel compiler and turned into a valid Scala program, but it goes through the Chisel front end. Your design is turned into Fertile. So as we call it as a circuit, as a kind of a, a design in Fertile. And then does various Fertile transformations on it and then eventually goes through the Verilog back end to produce the Verilog file. Um, like I said, we're kind of simplifying this pretty heavily, but just from high level, you know, DOS Gala comes in, uh, Chisel produces .fir, and the Fertile tools then produces a .v, right? So um, let's talk a little bit about what's inside there, right? So Inside there, uh, we have a few things, right? So uh, this is kind of talking about what kind of node types there are in Fertile. Um, this is a, a you know a hierarchy graph here, but some of these things you recognize right away, right? Oh yeah, no, we we we've been designing modules. We know what modules are. So a circuit is basically just the entire design as a whole. Okay, you know modules naturally have ports. That makes sense. And then modules are composed of you know statements. Well, what are statements? Um, Kind of a thing all quarter, how, you know, Chisel is basically instantiating things or connecting things. Uh, that's what statements are. So statements either are instantiating things, like instantiating an instance of a module, instantiating a register, instantiating a memory, or connecting things. Hey, I want to connect this to that. Um, and then within those statements, there's often things called expressions, or they're kind of, uh, you know, uh, things within there. So for example, like, you know, the expression io.in, you know, reference to that particular input port, that's an expression. Or, you know, maybe it's an operation, you know, it's uh, the addition operation, right? And then its inputs are also expressions, perhaps referring to, you know, signal A and referring to signal B, right? So it's gonna be expressions. Now, of course, all these operations and, you know, chisel, they're all typed. So there's, of course, also a notion of types. And we kind of keep track of all that. So these are kind of the various, uh, you know, classes involved in the fertile uh, IR. And so maybe make this more concrete. Let's look at the example design. Or actually, no, well, sorry, we can see listed out things I just explained to you verbally. Uh, like I said, the top level design is a circuit. You build out the modules. And of course, there's ports. So you can have types. And the big thing is, yeah, most of what we kind of think of the hardware is these statements. And these statements, you know, use types internally as well as expressions, right? So yeah, like I said, so these statements instantiate things, like things like a wire, we said, or, you know, connecting things. Um, and then expressions, we said you reference things like, you know, oh, I want to reference the signal that exists. I want to um, have, you know, two as a uint, which of course I need to use the type to get that information. Perhaps I want to do a mux or a do primitives, the umbrella for things like, you know, addition and stuff like that. Um, so yes, let's go ahead and look at a concrete example, right? So, uh, you know, all quarter we've been looking at Verilog. We'll go ahead and do that one more time. So yeah, okay, here's a tiny little design. You know, here it is in Verilog. Uh, you know, some module simply just takes this input, passes the register, passes the output. You know, by now I think the Verilog is almost kind of redundant. You guys are probably great at reading this chisel. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and look at the fertile. So the fertile isn't too crazy, right? Maybe actually you can put both side by side even if we fit them on the screen. Yeah, we can. Um, so looking at the fertile down here, right? Uh, what do we see? Well. 
uh, you know, okay, it's a module. Well, so overall, the entire thing's a circuit. It's the entire design, right? There's a module for delay, great. Then, uh, you know, we have the ports, right, for our, our, our module, right? So we have clock and reset, which remember they were implicit in the chisel, but, you know, they exist in both the Verilog and the Fertile, right? Um, interestingly, uh, the IO bundle is actually like an entire bundle here. You can see it's kind of all pulled together and inside there, uh, there is an in and an out. And actually you can see kind of like we covered before where the default direction is kind of an output. And if you want an input, you need to flip it, you know, to get the in inverse direction. Um, and then what else do we see? Well, we see they instantiate a register, right? So uh, reg in the case of fertile definitely means register. Uh, and we're calling it, you know, IO out reg. And there's some, you know, details about it, right? It happens to be of type you went with four. If that was inferred right here, we didn't specify that, but you know, Chisel's able to infer that. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, how is it uh, clocked? Well, you can see it's clocked with uh, reset. Um, and um, it initializes uh, to, uh, to zero, right? Um, which you can't always count on, right? But in this case, that's the tools had to choose that value, right? Um, meanwhile, uh, if you look at the other parameters inside here, you can see there's a connection from the input to the register and then from the register to the output. So yeah, so sometimes, like I said, to get more familiar with this, rather than reading Verilog, maybe you can read uh, Fertile to kind of see what kind of actually mapped out when the tools actually ran, but uh, maybe we can look at just the Fertile. Uh, yeah, okay. And uh, worth noting that, you know, in this notebook, I've taken a little effort to remove the comments. There would otherwise be, you know, line by line comments telling you where things came from, but in an notebook world where, you know, everything's coming from a .sc file, it's not as helpful. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and now look at that same design as uh, the fertile kind of in the way that the tools view it, right? So if you ask for it in terms of the abstract syntax here, the AST, if we go ahead and do that, um, you know, uh, oops, can this not scroll? There, yes, it can. Okay, so we can see that, um, if, you know, if we go ahead and, uh, you know, print out this AST, we can see all these things, right? We can see, for example, there's a module and the module has ports and there's a port for clock, there's a port for reset, there's a port for IO and IO is actually of type bundle. So then it has to then go inside there, right? Um, so you can see this kind of keeps going. Uh, this is kind of the pretty version of it. You can see normally it's kind of very rough and it's kind of hard to deal with. And so for that reason, there's a helper function we have, you know, we can kind of look at this perhaps in a more structured manner. Um, but yeah, you can see that, you know, kind of like we were just discussing a second ago, these are kind of all different various fields inside there and it all fits together kind of in this AS2 that you might see in the compiler or languages class. Um, cool. And so then uh, this example, of course, actually came from the paper introducing Fertile. And uh, so that's why I'm citing them right here. If you want to go ahead and read that. And uh, here it is graphically, right? So you perhaps maybe the most clear way of seeing it, right? Okay, so our module, what does it do? Well, we know it has ports, right? Any of those ports, we saw those, right? There's input clock, input in, output out. Technically, this is not quite perfectly visually correct. There's actually a bundle for in and out, but, you know, details. Uh, you know, then we have our types, you know, okay, everything's typed, okay. The clocks actually has a clock type. You know, we specify the input and outputs are of, you know, four bits wide. Okay. And then um, uh, there's statements in the thing, right? So uh, statements are, you know, individual uh, things. There's actually a special statement type called a block that's able to have multiple statements inside of it. That's what this is. And so then, yeah, we have instantiated register. We instantiate a connect and then we instantiate another connect, right? So we're connecting, you know, register to the input, the output to the register, right, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Cool. Questions so far? Okay, so then let's talk a little bit about how uh, Fertile works internally, right? So Fertile, I'm in this case referring to that library which somehow is bridging the gap from Chisel to uh, Verilog, right? And so, instead of, you know, a few minutes ago, one of the real nice things about having this approach is 
It's made the engineering tasks much more manageable because they're breaking down that large variety of transformations into what's called passes, right? And so we're, each of these passes, sometimes they're called nano passes, you know, we are making a small change at a time. And so they're taking many, many small steps, but by making each step smaller, it's much easier to kind of develop. It's kind of like a slow and steady way of, you know, doing this rather than trying to do just giant, two super complex things all at once, right? And so by having many manageable small steps, they're really easy to kind of specify what each step's supposed to do, easy to kind of test them and develop them. And yeah, because otherwise it's like, I need to, uh, you know, do this mass transformation. And you're kind of always asking yourself, wait, did I handle all cases? Do I, did I get this other thing right? And no, with these steps, you can kind of, with the IR, you kind of know which input output format is, it's the IR. And these steps are kind of usually very small, single things, right? So this is a well-known best practice from building compilers. You know, this is kind of what, you know, made LLVM so helpful. It had a really nice IR. Uh, and that's kind of why it's taken off so well. GCC has an IR, but the LLVM IR is so well specified and externalized that, you know, a lot of other languages like Rust or Swift uh, are able to just reuse a lot of the code bases from LLVM, right? Which is really cool. Um, cool. Okay. So talking more about what Fertile does though, uh, what's interesting is that uh, the Fertile IR spec is actually in just one spec. There's actually multiple specs, right? And so what's going on there is that um, there's this notion of high level Fertile and low level Fertile. So high level Fertile uh, is something that's pretty close to what you see in Chisel uh, versus low level Fertile is pretty close to something you'd see in Verilog, right? And so what's happening um, with this Fertile library is this processing your design is what we call lowering. It's taking something from high level Fertile to low level Fertile. And so to kind of make this more concrete, uh, high level Fertile uh, has a lot of things that are, you know, kind of more abstract and less unspecified. For example, something like a bit width where, you know, we saw in Chisel, you, know, you, can, you can leave some bit widths unspecified and the tools will infer it. Well, guess what? That inference is being done by Fertile, right? Um, and so in high-level Fertile, you can leave some bit widths unspecified. Meanwhile, in low Fertile, they need to be specified, right? Or certain other things, right? You know, um, in high-level Fertile, you'll have things like bundles and vex. You know, these are high-level nice constructs in when statements. Meanwhile, by the time you get down to low level fertile, they've all been turned into muxes and you know, your bundles have been flattened, so every field's its own variable and that kind of stuff, right? And that's kind of the point, is by the time you get things down to low fertile, it's basically like Verilog. It's technically fertile, but you know, it's all bit widths are known. There's no unusual operators, you know, no bundles, no whens. Um, and so it makes it much easier to build that kind of that ver later back, uh, Verilog backend, right? Meanwhile, so the high fertile is pretty close to what comes out of Chisel. So the Chisel front end actually isn't as complex as you might think because it's just creating high fertile. And so I said, in between is this lowering process where this fertile library is progressively applying these passes and these passes are going in and fixing things. In some cases they're optimizing. In other cases, they are, you know, I said lowering. They are taking things that are perhaps too high level and making them more concrete. And so uh, in terms of the specification, what's interesting is uh, low level fertile or low fertile, is actually just a subset of fertile. So actually high fertile is kind of the flexibility to do all these things with fertile. You have access to all node types, things like whens, ability to leave bit was unspecified. Low fertile is actually just a subset of fertile, which is just, you know, certain node types are excluded and, you know, you have everything all specified. You need to have all your bit was specified, et cetera. Um, and so like, we've been kind of talking about fertile transformation so far, just how to produce Verilog or how to optimize, but these, these, these Transformations can do a lot, right? It can, they can analyze your design, tell you certain things about it. They can instrument it with things like scan chains. They can specialize it. They can perform optimizations unique to your particular generator rather than just generic hardware optimizations, right? You can do a lot of things while working at the fertile level. Okay, so uh, kind of covering some of these operations, right? So like things like lowering paths. We've been talking about things like inferring whiffs, right? You know, going through design and crawling backwards and forwards through this IR to try and figure out how big certain whiffs should be, right? In other cases, we've seen it's perfectly valid chisel, for example, to have things sometimes in some cases connecting to each other that aren't even the same width. And so to remove the possibility to compile the Verilog tools doing something unspecified, uh, fertile pads the widths that are equal by the time it gets to Verilog, right? So if they were unequal in the chisel, it goes ahead and makes them equal in the Verilog by, you know, perhaps adding zeros or cats zeros when it needs to do that. 
or they said things like when statements, right? Those are things that exist in chisel. They exist in high fertile, but not in low fertile, right? So you can go ahead and turn those into muxes and the right connections, right? Um, and also what's nice is a lot of the things that check for safety, you know, things like combination loops and other things, those are all done by the fertile library instead of chisel front end. So you kind of have this lean chisel front end, which actually Jack talked a little bit about on Monday. And we will kind of do a lot in these fertile library passes, right? And so where, you know, where is the mass of the code for this kind of chisel fertile tool, tool flow? Most of the code is actually in these fertile passes, right? That there's a, you know, a lightweight chisel front end. Um, there's a chisel standard library on top of chisel, but that's not really the front end, it's just the chisel standard library. And then the, the fertile is really kind of doing all this heavy lifting, right? And then there's also course transformations that are authorizations that we covered. Like so, and some of these actually really kind of match what you might see in a software compiler. Things like constant propagation, right? So, hey, uh, if I have a, you know, literal, like, you know, like true or, you know, for as a uint, I can go ahead and perhaps simplify some of the logic or math knowing this, right? I can go ahead and simplify things. And, you know, as I said before, make the tools do the work. Tools can do things with like constant propagation pretty well, right? Uh, similarly, dead code elimination, right? You know, if something's not connected, we're going to prune that, right? <laughs> so, you know, sometimes people have this issue where they try to, they want to write a module to see the output, and then if you keep seeing the module cut away by the tools, you gotta make sure the outputs, the output that model is actually touched, it's attached to something. Otherwise, the tools are gonna be like, oh, this is disconnected, this is floating, you don't need this, I'm gonna cut it, right? Or other things like common so expression elimination, right? If you keep repeating the same expression, uh, the tools can recognize, oh wait, that's the same expression. I can, you know, do this once and then make that harder once, and then you know, send a signal elsewhere, right? These are kind of very much compiler-like transformations you can do in hardware. And uh, some of these are done well by the downstream CAD tools. We also can do them at the fertile level as well. And so there's just a couple of them, but it kind of gives you a sense. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and pause a second for any questions. So, uh, so far, I've kind of been just talking about Fertile, and what you've seen so far, even though I'm motivated by talking about writing your own optimizations, so far I'm talking about the Fertile main library itself. So kind of the question is, what could you do if you were like a you know chisel user in Fertile, right? Uh, so an example of that, there's a project called FireSim, which some of you may have heard of, which is actually pretty cool. Uh, this is a research project that's got some adoption, and it's a way to simulate a data center, right? So if you're trying to simulate the hardware for a future data center, that seems pretty daunting, right? Because wait a second, you're talking about, you know, like thousands of CPUs, network switches, all of this stuff. Uh, you know, if you wrote that in software simulation, you know, that would go really slow, right? That doesn't make any sense, right? How would that work, right? And then you're like, oh wait, in order to make this even run at all, I probably have to have like a really simple model for CPU. Like each CPU is like model by a thread. I can't actually like model the hardware or anything. The FireSim is pretty cool. And it actually says, no, you actually can simulate this with pretty high fidelity, right? So what FireSim does, it actually takes chisel designs and runs them on FPGAs, and not just on a couple FPGAs, but actually uses cloud FPGAs like an Amazon F1. So you can use, you know, hundreds of thousands of cloud FPGAs that actually simulate thousands of CPUs working together in a data center. And so that's actually really cool. And, you know, you think, oh, that doesn't sound too hard, right? I could just take my chisel and just chuck it on FPJ. Well, no, you need to do a little more than that, right? Because you need to build a logic to talk between FPJs and do all that kind of stuff. Okay, what's well, you can imagine that could be done. That seems not so bad. But then it starts getting really tricky. So I realize, wait a second, I want this to actually be an accurate simulation, right? And so if I have, you know, one FPGA running, let's say 10 megahertz, and FPGA running at 20 megahertz, and they talk across the network, which is, you know, way slower than that, how do I get, you know, a reasonable representation of the time and ordering of events? And the answer is you kind of need to, you know, have virtualized time, right? You need to have, you know, you go in and have each FPGA understand, you know, this moment I'm doing this cycle for this CPU and I'm doing this cycle for this CPU and you kind of need to And so you can imagine building this thing would be tons of work you're trying to put all this into your design to also make a simulator for your design. So instead what FireSim does is actually it takes your design, which you give to it in Chisel, turns it into Fertile, then it goes around and crawls around that Fertile and does the various things needed to actually make this thing work out. So it goes ahead and instruments your design, you know, carves up across FPGAs, um, connects them across it, makes them make connections across there, puts in the ability to, you know, pause and restart these things to um, get the various behaviors. Like I said, you have, you know, all these things trying to emulate data center. Uh, you need to kind of be able to have this virtualized time. And so it actually tracks for your element, what 
time step this on and making sure it kind of is the right thing. So this is all kind of this really crazy, amazing tool, but it said it was built surprisingly productively because it was able to reuse Fertile, right? And so it's modifying your design, it's adding instrumentation, it's kind of all this crazy stuff under the hood, but it's doing this via Fertile. So that was kind of the original thing. It was actually a project that was called Golden Gate, but for most part, it's kind of blurred into FireSim, which looked at this and said, wait a second, if you know, if we're simulating a data center and we have, you know, many CPUs of the exact same architecture, why should we give each CPU its own piece of the FPGA logic? Why don't we say we have multiple CPUs sharing the same FPGA logic over time, you know, time multiplexing them, and just kind of change the state, change the values of the memory, right? And so that's what Golden Gate does. So it goes ahead and looks for ways to improve resource efficiency by overlapping and reusing things. And so it's sharing multiplexing things, right? And so this is really cool where, uh, once again, it's a fertile trans set of first transformations. It goes in, crawls your design, looks for things that are similar, overlaps them, and does all the automatic scheduling of, oh, you know, now I have instead of two CPUs or two separate pieces of hardware, I now have one piece of hardware with two pieces of memory. I know how to, uh, you know, access memory A at the right time versus access memory B and how to swap the state and such. And so this is a tool which is going in and crawling around hardware and building hardware to kind of do these things, right? And this is this is pretty cool where it'd be great to build a cat tools to do this. And these are novel cat research contributions because people previously hadn't attempted this because obviously it would have been really hard, but by able to do this with Fertile, it also became in reach of graduate student researchers. Um, and this is pretty cool. Um, and so, yeah, this is one example. I have a link to the papers here if you're curious, go look them up. Or you can go, you know, run this on Amazon. Um, and so another Fertile user, of course, is myself. That's, I might as well disclose my own biases. So as a research project, uh, you know, I started, but I'm now happy to have students here doing tremendous contributions. It's called Essent, right? And so what is Essent? It's a Fertile simulator, right? So all quarter, of course, you've been using um, you've similar chisel design, something called Treadle, which is a Scala-based uh, Fertile simulator. And I recommend you guys use that because it's so easy to get going, right? Just another jar package and boom, you're running. Very fast startup time. Um, but you can imagine it's not super, super fast, right? Normally folks want to go faster, you use this tool called Verilator, which is a the standard open source Verilog simulator. Uh, and so you use chisel to produce Verilog and you pass it to Verilator. And that's a lot faster than Treadle. And then in Essent, we are trying to compete with something like Verilator. And right now we're, you know, the size is 2x, we're closer to 3 to 5x faster than Verilator. And so what we're doing is we're doing a variety of pretty aggressive optimizations. Uh, and these optimizations, I would argue, are much easier for us to do than they are for Verilator to do because we're able to take advantage of Fertile, right? So Verilator is, you know, now over 20 years old. It's a C++ code base, which has to go in and read Verilog in. It actually spits out C++ code that you compile and make this a fast simulator, right? And uh, so how does Essent work, the tool I made? It reads in Fertile. Well, it doesn't read in, it's already given to it by the library, so it's able to kind of reuse that code. Manipulates the Fertile, and then actually has a C++ backend. So actually it turns that Ver a Fertile and a C++, and you compile it to get your fast simulator, right? And so, um, it's pretty cool, right? And so, uh, so right now, it's three to five times faster these days than Verilator. Uh, what's amazing more is that, you know, I'm able to do some about 5,000 lines of Scala, right? Um, and the reason why it's so much shorter than Verilator, which is, you know, way, 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 way longer, it's not just Scala versus Plus, it's also the fact that this Fertile library provides a lot for me, right? It handles all the, you know, uh, parsing and bringing stuff in. It provides all the safety checks. It does things like dead code eliminations, common set question elimination for me. So I can really focus on what makes my project unique, right? Which is, you know, these clever ideas we have we have in our group about how to do simulation faster, right? And so, yeah, we're able to kind of build this CAD tool way more productively than you could otherwise because, yeah, um, this is how you do it. And so even here, you know, I pitched these kind of these uh, big projects that are, you know, full-on tools happen to use Fertile. Not every Fertile use needs to be that uh, ambitious, right? That, you know, well, people in industry often do it for things like, yeah, I want to insert a scan chain. So that's only, you know, a single fertile path. It's not, you know, many, many things, right? And so I'm just kind of showing these tools, kind of show one extreme, the extreme is lightweight things like doing a scan chain or something. Okay, so uh, hopefully I kind of got you excited about hardware IRs, right? Uh, it's kind of pretty cool where now you can start thinking about hardware in this kind of formal way and you can kind of go about and think about manipulating and changing it. It's kind of a real uh, enabler for those who want to kind of manipulate our designs or to make tools. And as kind of alluded to all lecture, there's quite a few 
hardware IRs out there now. So uh, there have been some in the past. Um, and I said the kind of real difference that's happened recently is there's kind of been critical mass achieved for some of them, and they're also been kind of exposed, right? Some people have kind of been using them, right? So Fertile's the one inside Chisel. And a lot of things you learn about Fertile, I think, applies at our IRs, even though it's not quite exactly the same. Uh, Yosis is a really, really popular open source tool flow. It actually can read uh, Fertile, um, but internally it's something called RTLIL. That's their intermediate language for them. Uh, Stanford uh, has a variety of you know, open source CAD tool projects. They uh, have uh, Core IR is theirs. Um, then, of course, uh, from Europe, there is the LLHD, which, uh, you know, perhaps that, you know, name you might make you think, oh, that's perhaps from the folks that did LLVM. But no, you'd be wrong. Uh, the folks that did LLVM, including, you know, none other than Chris Latner himself, actually making an IR, and it's called Circuit. And actually, in the six months from when, since when I first made the slide, I went from, oh, they're doing this to, oh, it's, it's already doing really cool stuff. So um, Circuit's designed to interoperate well with Fertile because uh, originally its development was being paid for by Sci-5, you know, Chisel and Chisel's main maintainers. But it's C++ based, it's a very fast IR, and it, it can do some, some things really well. And in some cases where you kind of swap out Circuit for Fertile in the middle of your tool flow, it's like, you know, 100x faster because, you know, guess what? Roll and Stuff Plus code is pretty fast compared to Scala. Um, so yeah, it's exciting. There's a growing landscape of these things. So today, so I covered Fertile because that one's kind of what we're doing for this course, we're doing with this course, but there's a lot of these IRs out there. So if you go out and do your own hardware project in the future, uh, that's kind of what's possible. Fertile, I think, compared to these other ones, probably has the most uh, used by other tools. Um, so today I kind of covered, you know, uh, some of those similar tools. There's actually multiple languages that have front end or back ends for Fertile. Um, Things like, you know, Pertle from Santa Barbara is a backend for Fertile. Uh, one of the other Stanford languages, um, Magma, not Magma, sorry. Uh, the other one, I was going to mix it up. Oh, Spatial has a Fertile backend. Um, yeah, there's, there's, it's a fun time to be in open source hardware. There's a lot of different tools going on. Um, cool. Uh, any last questions?